Hello, my name's Steve Wade. I'm a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Centre at Stockholm University in Sweden. And I'd like to tell you about this paper that I published with co-authors a couple of months ago. Resilience is a increasingly popular concept in public life and public discourse. It also has a long history in academia, uh, probably longest in material science and engineering, but with a history that goes back almost half a century, all, also in psychology and ecology, and with a uh, prolif proliferation to a number of other disciplines within recent decades. I'm going to broadly group different approaches to resilience into these three categories. First of all, we've got systems perspectives on resilience that emphasize, for example, multi-stability, regime shifts, tipping points, feedbacks, or these sorts of phenomena. Then we've also got individual perspectives on resilience, which focus on individual capacities, uh, people's response diversity, option space, capital's approaches fit into this category as well. And then there's also pathways perspectives on uh, resilience, such as this approach by Erlen Enforsch and the work of the STEP Centre in the UK. All these different approaches are useful in their own right, but what if we want to take a systems and an individual perspective at the same time? This is the goal of this paper, to develop an approach to resilience that incorporates systems elements with individual elements, and that is also context sensitive so that it doesn't try to apply the same metric to resilience across all cases, but uh, adapts the measure of resilience to the specific things that confer resilience in a specific case, and also is ideally measurable. The concept that we propose in this paper is called pathway diversity. In this understanding of resilience, the basic idea is that actors are, or system is more resilient when the active actors have more pathways available to them. In this paper, we understand a pathway as a sequence of options or actions. And one of the fundamental motivations is that having more options is good, that confers uh, resilience from an individual perspective, but we also need to think about the consequences of those actions. And, and that's where the system element comes in. If somebody takes an option that undermines, for example, their natural capital or their financial capital, that will reduce their uh, number of options and therefore their resilience in the longer term. So we've got the individual part, we've got the system part, uh, we've got the context sensitivity because what these pathways look like will vary very much in different cases. And we've also got a way to calculate it. We could calculate pathway diversity simply by adding up the number of these different pathways, or if we get more sophisticated, there are other approaches such as one called causal entropy that could also uh, calculate pathway diversity. In the paper, we applied this approach in a couple of toy models. The first one, more a qualitative model, um, a toy agricultural scenario, and we're representing the different pathways here using the adaptation pathways framework. We were able to show uh, that the choices that the pathway diversity approach would recommend to maximise resilience matches up with uh, an, an, an intuitive understanding of what one would expect the pathway of maximal resilience to be. We also looked at it in a more computational context. We made a simple uh, state and transition model of a poverty trap. Interestingly, our pathway diversity approach showed that the poor state of the poverty trap is actually the one of low resilience according to pathway diversity. That's sometimes how resilience is used out in, in the, out in the wide world. But most models of poverty traps and resilience have the poor state as the state of high resilience because it's more stable. So it's interesting that our approach matches up with that more intuitive understanding of what resilience should be like. So the next steps are to apply this approach to more realistic models uh, beyond these very stylized models so far. Specifically, I have uh, a grant to look at uh, resilience in Australian water resources starting mid next year. And also I think there's quite a lot of scope to apply this work, not only in quantitative settings, but participatory qualitative settings as well. That's the paper once again, and thank you very much for your time. Hello everyone. 
I'm Sneha Kachara. I'm a PhD candidate at Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Aisa Tirupati from India. And today I would like to discuss a really interesting problem, which is to analyze cardiac dynamics from ECG. And we used what is known as a multiplex recurrence network framework for it. So um, coming to the recurrence networks, suppose you have a uh, time series, let's say for Rosler system, which is in chaotic regime, what you can do is you can construct the attractor in phase space and uh, using delay embedding. And then you can analyze uh, which pair of uh, points are close by. So uh, you can establish, you can sort of imagine a network in which every uh, node is, rep is uh, uh, rep uh, corresponding to the point in the attractor. And uh, two nodes are connected if corresponding points are close by on the attractor. So the data that we worked with is a multi-lead ECG data, which is uh, taken from the uh, electrodes which are placed closest to the heart. So they are chest and then uh, you have six uh, different electrodes and you get six different time series, which are all synchronized in time. Um, and this is taken from PhysioNet. You, we had 51 healthy subjects and uh, some other subjects with uh, different diagnosis, such as bundle branch block, cardiomyopathy, etc. And uh, what we did was we constructed MRNs, multiplex recurrence networks for all of them. To analyze this network, we found that a three level characterization worked best. So the first level, uh, which is the most crude level, is a link uh, overlap or edge overlap. So what you do is uh, you, know, you, you take all the links and then you see how many of them overlap across layers. Uh, other thing that, you, that we analyzed was degree distribution. Uh, which is simply to compare the degrees of nodes, how they differ from the corresponding nodes on different layers. And then finally, the clustering coefficients. So for edge overlap, uh, edge overlap what we found was the value for healthy people was between 0 0.15 to 0 0.55. And in extreme cases of diseases, it went as high as 0.9. Now, uh, coming to the degree distributions, we analyze node to node similarity uh, in terms of the degree. And we also analyze the similarity in terms of overall probability distributions. And what we did was we calculated this value for each pair, each uh, uh, subject for each pair of layer. And uh, these measures were then compared with healthy. And if they were significantly different, then the corresponding matrix element was, uh, uh, was assigned a particular value of their color based on the p-value. And as you can see that for cosine similarity, we have discrete blocks but for mutual information, you see entire rows of the layers. Coming to the clustering coefficients, we, sh we uh, found similar difference. What we did was we calculated the clustering coefficients of all the nodes, and then we compared them uh, with the clustering coefficient of the corresponding nodes. Uh, so this is the index of dissimilarity. And again, we found some discrete uh, pair of layers for bundle branch and dysrhythmia but many pair of layers for cardiomyopathy and myocardial infarction. Um, so to summarize our results, what we found was there is no single measure that can specifically distinguish healthy from patients, at least not from this particular framework, but a combination of them can. The advantage of this framework is that it allows you to pinpoint the nature of anomaly, not just to classify, but also to pinpoint what is the difference that is uh, causing the, uh, which is manifesting in terms of the disease. So the uh, diseases such as bundle branch block and cardiomyopathy, we found them to be localized. And uh, dysrhythmia and myocardial infarction seem to be uh, affecting all the parts of the heart. So such a study, if <clears throat> so if we have a larger number of data set, we would like to repeat the study. And then uh, we, we are also thinking of sort of combining it with machine learning based uh, classification scheme so that you have an improved classification uh, uh, and diagnosis uh, algorithm, which is informed by the uh, features of dynamics as apparent in the ECG. So it is not a, a blind classification, so as to speak. And this framework is very general. It is not limited to time series data. Any data which has a sort of correspondence between different variables that you have, then uh, it can be converted to a multiplex network, and then the similar characterization can be applied. The details of this uh, work can be found in the references, and I welcome any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. 
and welcome to this talk on sound, complexity and incompleteness. My name is Juan Carrillo. I am an artist and researcher based in Lisbon. My talk is intended to stimulate thought and discussion and above all to inspire the community for future work in the theory and techniques of dealing with sound. Is sound predictable or computable? What distinguishes an organized or complex sound? Although the literature on complex systems is vast, research on the application of complex thought to sound is notably scarce. Sound certainly has the potential to a general complexity approach, particularly for its double nature as acoustic entity, as studied by physics, and as conscious experience, as studied by cognitive science. Let me start by giving a few examples about the importance of sound for foundational scientific questions and then finish off with some speculations on sonic complexity and incompleteness. The cosmic microwave background is a fundamental evidence of the Big Bang. It shows the universe at 380,000 years of age and it is homogeneous roughly to one part in 100,000. Variations in color correspond to variations in temperature, which in turn represent differences in pressure. But such pressure waves can be interpreted as sound waves, and thus what one might imagine it was ultimately sound that organized matter into galaxies, galaxy clusters, and all the filaments of the cosmic web. In fact, the sound with the lowest frequency ever to be detected by humans corresponds to a B-flat 57 octaves below middle C and probably originates in a black hole at the center of the Perseus galaxy cluster by the inflation of bubbles of relativistic plasma. The study of such sounds can help astrophysicists understand the formation and evolution of galaxies. The sound you just heard corresponds to one of the key scientific experiments of the lifetimes. For thousands of years we have looked at the sky as in a silent movie. However, in 2015, scientists at LIGO announced the detection of gravitational waves from the collision of two black holes, 100 years after Einstein's theory. The cosmic movie became audiovisual because the energy of such collisions is so high that, as Jenna Levin puts it, space-time literally resonates like a drum. Space-time is no longer static. It can vibrate, just like a musical instrument. We might compare it to a sonic Galilean revolution. Sound may lie at the edge of our knowledge of the physical world. Yet, as stated by Richard Dawkins, physics is still about simplicity, even when it is deeply paradoxical. To find true complexity, we must jump to biology. Compare the simplicity of the upward glissando that emerges from the collision of two black holes with the detailed structure of the sound of a single cell. The sounds of planet Earth are so strange and unique as the life forms that inhabit it. The year is a microcosmos of the macrocosmos, involving under natural selection for billions of years, not to mention cultural evolution. To measure the complexity of sound, some authors have proposed spectral flatness, defined as the ratio between the geometric and the arithmetic means. It is presumably difficult to measure the logical depth of a Beethoven symphony but it is even harder to imagine an algorithm that would produce the number sequence required to digitally encode a symphony other than a copy of the sound samples of the original recording, which amounts to a string as long as its source. To interpret spectral flatness as a complexity measure might be a good start. In my own research, I have considered the combination of complexity clues both in the acoustic and the cognitive layers. From the short time Fourier transform, it is possible to obtain not only the capstrom, but also the spectral fluctuation by taking a second spectrum estimation of each spectral band while simultaneously accounting for masking effects. Our understanding of complexity is intertwined with our understanding of time. Perhaps time emerges from an unsurmountable blurring or incompleteness of a description, such as the time frequency indeterminacy. 
Perhaps Gödel's theorems will convince us that sound is a non-computational process. Perhaps we need to understand complexity as a musical aesthetic. Ultimately, numerical simulation is of limited use in reasoning about the problem of complexity. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Vasilis Gavril and I'm coming from the National Hellenic Research Foundation in Athens, Greece. My lightning talk is about photon processed and chaotic networks and how they can regulate a thermodynamic chaotic state interplay in two dimensional surfaces. Let's begin with nano cavities. Imagine a top surface, which looks like that, where there are present an amount of holes or cavities, which diameter is a few nanometers. There, potentially, can be trapped molecules, analytes, or atoms, which is called molecular confinement. The space around the surface and the surface can be divided in three different domains. The first one, the external domain, or else the thermodynamic domain, as it, the thermodynamic equations are valid. There, the movement of the molecules can be simulated as an ideal gas movement. So, the characteristic time of this domain is the mean collision time, which depends on pressure and temperature. The second one is the two-dimensional surface domain, where nanocavities are present, or else the local fluctuation domain. The molecules there have a chaotic behavior as they are trapped inside the nanocavities. The movement of them inside the nanocavities can be simulated as a random walk movement. So, the characteristic time is the escape time. In other words, the time a molecule passes inside the nanocavity before it exits to the external domain. The last one is the volume domain, the bulk material, where no movement is present and the characteristic time is infinite. Let's take a look at the local fluctuation domain and the random walk movement. After a random walk simulation that we ran, we calculated the escape time, the time a molecule passes inside the nanocavity. It depends on the size of the nanocavity and the size of the entrance escape hole, either for one molecule or more than one trapped molecule. The escape time we calculated was 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 12 seconds, which is much smaller than the mean collision time which we said is the characteristic time of the external domain. And for a water molecule, for example, is about 70 nanoseconds. So, the two-dimensional surface is a time boundary itself. From inside nanocavities, where the characteristic time is the escape time, to outside, where the characteristic time is a mean collision time. This time differentiation inside and outside nanocavities adds a state of ordered arrangements and introduces an interplay between the thermodynamic, the external domain, and the chaotic state of the nanocavity domain. This agrees with the entropy deviation that is also present in our configuration. As molecular confinement is going on, the entropic dynamic gets higher. The entropic change follows the confinement of water molecules in nanocavities because of a polar and entropic force competition as it happens in biological systems. The physical root of surface entropy variations comes from this differentiation in time flow and time scales, leading to a thermal equilibrium outside the nanocavities and a non-thermal inside the nanocavities. This theory also applies in biological systems such as cells. Let's take a look at the fabrication of these nanocavity networks. We use the energy of 157 nanometer BUV laser, which pulse has an energy of about 7 electron volts. This energy is used to excite a molecular site in a polymeric chain from a state A to an excited state B and then a dissociative state gamma, where the parent molecule dissolves in smaller fragments. This radiation 
leads to the modification of the surface and the creation of nano cavities, which are measured by atomic force microscopy and fractal analytical method gave as a result a relatively high fractal dimension. To conclude, two dimensional photonic crafted surface defines a topological surface where the characteristic time of processes suddenly jumps from a thermodynamic state to a chaotic one over a time topological surface which is identical to the Euclidean topological surface. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I am Bosil Ketalic from J. Stefan Institute and will share with you some ideas about our agent-based modeling uh, for SARS-CoV-2 epidemics. Uh, the model is developed with Roderick Melnik and uh, you can find more details in this page. Um, within this uh, modeling approach, we can take into account personal features of, uh, of uh, human hosts and uh, virus survival time outside of the host, which is relevant for the process. So, uh, social dynamics drives this system, and in this case, we take empirical time series from uh, social networks, which has this typical daily fluctuations with one hour resolution. It brings new susceptible individuals every hour in the area where they can uh, be exposed to active viruses and some get infected. 80% of them is uh, asymptomatically infected and they walk around for about 14 days before spontaneous recovery, while others get hospitalized after two to, to seven days. So latent infection transmission that, uh, that we are interested in is mostly due to this asymptomatic individuals and those before hospitalization, as well as the viruses surviving in the outside environment for hours. So uh, an infected individual um, uh, is a host for the virus. Uh, it's uh, important features which uh, uh, affects this process is susceptibility, which is personal individual, and the exposition time as well as uh, state which changes during the process. For the viruses, this is survival time and the generation, which means the following when we have, as uh, represented on this bipartite graph, infections graph, infected individual uh, produces viruses around it, and some of them are caught by other susceptible, then uh, viruses trans transmitted, and this one starts producing new viruses, and so on, and so on. So generation of the virus means number of these hops before the last infected individual. So it is interesting for, uh, to consider possible mutation of the virus uh, during this, uh, these hops. And for instance, that the virus becomes more um, friendly to the, to the host, we can uh, model this uh, modification of transmission rate as a decaying function. Um, it also depends on the individual uh, susceptibility of, of a given host and there is some feedback, dynamical feedback, which we can control from controlling total number of active viruses and active carriers. So in the case of mutation, you see this red curve uh, fluctuates, uh, there's a transmission rate fluctuates uh, around much lower level than in the case of non mutation. And this will affect the whole process that we can control in this agent-based model by bringing new individuals, this pale, pale curve, recruiting exposed individuals, which fluctuates over hours, then number of inf infected uh, with and without um, uh, virus mutation, this red and black curve, corresponding fluctuations of the active number of viruses is a top black curve and the active carriers is this middle black curve. They, uh, they result in the overall increase of the total number of infected, which is known as infection, infection curve. And you see in the case of virus mutation, this corresponding rate curves are much lower. So in this framework, we can uh, model different scenarios. For instance, we have very uh, normal social dynamics for six weeks, like this time series up here and then uh, lockdown with much less, much less participation. 
And you see that the infection curves increase and then they level up due to lockdown, uh, but not immediately. It's uh, something like 50, uh, 15 days uh, delay. And different curves are for the same uh, social participation, but different uh, exposition time of individuals. For instance, if the individual is exposed for 20, up to from 1 to 24 hours, you have leveling up at this 2000 level, but if it is one week, it's three times large number of infected. So in this framework, um, we can simulate with the obvious limitations which are discussed in our paper, um, we can simulate um, the processes and assess uh, importance of different biological and social factors. For instance, we can say that social activity level is very critical. That's why lockdown could work for a while. Exposition time is important. Uh, virus mutations can help, but biology cannot solve the problem. That's all. So more in this paper. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody. My name is Giorgio Somnino, and uh, I prepared this work in cooperation with my colleague Filippe Terz and Pasquale Nardone of the Université Libre de Bruxelles, uh, Brussels, Belgium. The title of uh, our work is Modeling the Coronavirus Second Waves in Presence of the Lockdown and the Quarantine Measures. The dynamic equations for the entire process are derived by adopting a kinetic type reactions approach. More specifically, the lockdown and the quarantine measures are modeled by some kind of inhibitor reactions where susceptible and infectious individuals can be trapped into inactive states. The dynamics for the recovered people is obtained by also accounting people who are traced back to hospitalized infectious uh, individuals. To get the evolution equation, we take inspiration from the michaelis menten enzyme substrate reaction model, the so-called MM reaction model, where the enzyme is associated to the available hospital beds, the substrate to the infectious people, and the products of the reactions to the recovered people, respectively. The main results achieved in our work are the following. We show that our model is able to produce predictions not only on the first, but also on the second or even the third waves of infection by SARS-CoV-2. The theoretical predictions are in line with the official numbers of cases with the minimal parameter fitting, we analyzed the Belgium case. We discussed the strengths and the limitations of the proposed model regarding the long-term predictions, and we took into consideration also the delay in the reaction step. The, uh, the model is, um, is given by the following schemes. The susceptible individuals is modeled in the, in the following way. The category S plus the compartment E gives twice compartment E. Mu is the, is the constant chemical rate. The lockdown and the quarantine measures are modeled in the following way. Uh, the, the compartment S plus the site L um, goes into the compartment SL the number of susceptible people in lockdown. The compartment E goes in quarantine infectious people and then to recovered. On the bottom right, you can see the lockdown uh, parameters, which is different from zero inside the door. The other uh, uh, the models are the same following. The modeling uh, of the hospitals is given by following, as I said, the MM reaction model. E plus the available bed give us the hospitalized infectious, which in turn can be either recovered or dead. Concerning the, uh, the scheme for infectious, for uh, recovery people, dead people, we have E goes to L, E goes to D. 
the, the dynamic uh, equation associated to the previous games are this one illustrated in these slides. The first two give us uh, the uh, susceptible people, the other three the infected people, and then uh, the recovered and the dead people. Uh, the, uh, of course, the, the sum of all the species is a constant. In this last slide, you can see the comparison between uh, theoretical predictions with uh, um, real data for Belgium. The parameters uh, shown in the upper of the slides has been uh, obtained by real data. The, 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 the bottom left figures give us the comparison between the theory and the real data. And the other two is the comparison, is the, the solution of the uh, ordinary differential equation for infected recovery and dead people and for infected recovering and dead people hospitalized. So the, our conclusions are the following. Uh, our chemical mode is able to produce prediction not only for the first, but also for the second wave of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. These, uh, these numbers are very sensitive to several parameters, in particular to recovery time delay TR. Our work, uh, future work, consists uh, in uh, will consist in, to proposing, in uh, proposing a stochastic model in order to obtain a comparative analysis against the deterministic one. Here you can find the reference which have been taken into account. Hello everybody, my name is Samir Suez. I come from uh, Italy. I am uh, of the University of Padova and uh, I call it the Laboratory of Interdisciplinary Physics. And today I would like to tell you about a recent work we have just published where we tackle through a complex system approach, a very long standing open question in bioinformatics. As you may understand, uh, understanding uh, biodiversity today is of crucial importance. And I would say that for a complex scientist is also a fantastic challenge. In fact, that thanks to massive parallel sequencing and advances in technological uh, uh, approaches, we uh, have now available a huge big data uh, that characterize biodiversity at a different scale. These, for example, are laboratory experiment where you extract some environmental sample and then you analyze the, the, the microbial diversity in the lab. But you can actually, uh, through the same kind of techniques, uh, characterize uh, the biodiversity at planetary scale. For example, this is the case of marine biodiversity, plankton in particular, and this is about uh, microbial diversity um, uh, on Earth, uh, also in different kinds of environmental gradients. So these data are very interesting and they represent a challenge, uh, both in terms of uh, their analysis and also in the opportunity in identifying the rule driving the functioning of such complex system. Uh, how to analyze such a data? Well, uh, of course, I cannot go into the detail, but there are two different main methods. One is called 16S, and the other one is called shotgun metagenomics. These two methods, basically in two different ways, based on clustering and alignments, can give you the taxonomic profiling of the original community, sample community. That is to say, it's, uh, they are able to tell you which species are present and the abundance of such species. So, uh, the question arises naturally, we are, does these two methods give the same answer? Actually, the answer, uh, the, uh, the, the answer is no. The two, the two methods uh, typically uh, give different answers. That is, so how can we use such a data to understand the uh, biodiversity if we don't know uh, the limitation of these two methods? Well, typically, typically you don't have the ground truth of the, of the underlying, of the original community. But you can actually do the same study uh, through mock communities. So where you uh, actually do in the lab, uh, you um, extract DNA from a known microbial community, and then you try uh, to reconstruct the ground truth through these two methods. And indeed, as you can see here, um, the number of species of, of, of the original communities is seven. And uh, while the 16S give a reasonable uh, prediction for the number of species, the correlation of the predicted abundance is very low. On the other way, on the other hand, uh, shotgun metagenomics give a uh, very, uh, uh, I mean, high correlation for the most abundant species. So the correlation for the abundance is very high, but it also gives a very huge number of false positives. So it doesn't predict the number of species in the community. Well, our method 
uh, is based on uh, emergent pattern in protein family. So as you know, proteins can be uh, characterized both in terms of functional structures. Well, if we characterize them in terms of uh, structure, then they, these are called protein domains or PFAM, P families. And uh, each protein, so the amount of protein that a given organism can produce, uh, can be characterized by the presence or the absence of this protein family. And if you study the emergent statistics of such protein families, you can, you can see that the, this display uh, uh, in the frequency uh, on the different proteins um, power law uh, shape. And there are uh, defined the core PFAM as the PFAM that are occurring only one or few times per proteome, but they are present in all the proteins. So in all the species. Well, uh, exploiting such result, we, we built a novel taxonomic classification method and uh, here is, has been tested against the, uh, the, the microbial community, mock community that I showed before. And you can see that now both the abundance are, uh, and the number of species, so here are six, are uh, well described. So we can describe both the number of species and the abundance in, in a correct way. And uh, we test this also against uh, mock communities with intermediate biodiversity. So higher biodiversity, 69 species and 193 species. And in all these cases, we in, fa in fact found that our method is able to predict both the number of species and the abundance of such species in a very uh, strong way, uh, outperforming the previous uh, the other methods. So I, we think that this uh, uh, CORCAU can provide a, a more accurate biodiversity char characterization of real microbiomes community, thus putting the, putting the basis for more solid analysis in microbiomes. I want to thank you. Uh, there is uh, uh, actually uh, the reference can be found in uh, in uh, our web page and also there you can also uh, find all uh, open codes and clicks. So thank you very much for your attention. Hello, I am Sandro Souza. I am based at the School of Mathematical Sciences at Queen Mary University of London. And today I will talk about the work in collaboration with my supervisor Vincenzo Nicosia, where we developed a model of segregation based on mobility and homophily. But first, why segregation matters? Urban segregation is a long-standing issue in many places. An example is this typical pattern here of a wealthy neighborhood close to a very poor area. Understanding these dynamics helps to develop more inclusive public policies, which can reduce inequality among population groups and support the most vulnerable ones. The latter is even more important now with COVID disproportionately affecting minorities, in particular African Americans in the US. This is an issue that we investigated recently and more details can be found on this preprint. So the model we propose here is quite simple. We have agents living in a lattice, which is represented by a weighted graph, and agents belong to one of the C colors dividing the population in this system. We also define these two basic quantities with agents of class alpha in node i and the total population of node i where both depend on time. Note that the color here represents the predominant group, but in fact, each node as a population distribution, like in this example here. The dynamics of this model is given by a random walk that depends on homophily and the mobility parameters. With low preference, the system behaves like a uniform random walk, while high preference causes concentration of the same color. When moving, an agent selects one of its neighbors according to the preference function, which basically depends on the abundance of a color at the neighboring nodes. We can now simulate this synthetic society and after ages interact for a long time, we obtain the phase diagram of the regimes that the system converts to. We also define rho to account for the differences in the population between neighboring nodes so that small values indicate a uniform population distribution while large values indicate concentration of the same color, meaning segregation. We see here at the yellow region that segregation is dominant for most combination of parameters, in particular for values of beta above 0 0.5. While increasing mobility actually helps to reduce segregation, but the system gradually converts to segregated regimes 
when preference increases. What we do next is to look at the row values for real data. We rank metropolitan areas in the US by their corresponding segregation level. Then we plug in the data obtained from census to our model, considering the graph from the neighborhood's adjacency. And we look at the set of parameters that lead to the real values of row. Note that most cities are in this small region here of parameters where abrupt changes of regimes can happen. Here we can see some examples. We highlight the region where the model converts to the value of the real system, which is marked by this uh, gray circle. Many cities exhibit this set of solutions that look like some sort of stripe. And despite both cities may look similar, the reddish area in Boston actually indicates that it is harder to reach extreme segregation here compared to Washington. Other cities exhibit an interesting combination of parameters, which is quite different from the one before, including an even narrower set of solutions like here in Las Vegas, or a larger set of solutions like in Orlando. Overall, this means that some cities share features which lead the model to converge to a similar set of parameters, while other cities have a quite unique set of solutions. And this concludes my message for today. To summarize, I showed here that the model is simple but very insightful. Segregation dominates most of the regimes, but mobility is useful to decrease it. And finally, real uh, cities lie in a very small set of parameters given by the model. Thanks for listening. You can find me here to know more. Hello, everyone. I'm Taha Yassir from School of Sociology at University College Dublin, Ireland. Today, I'm going to talk about collaboration. We are always told that collaboration and teamwork is a good thing and that increases chances of success. If you search such terms on Google, you will find thousands of images like this one, uh, which shows um, groups of colleagues who uh, seem to be very happy working uh, together and just smiling like there is no tomorrow. In complex system terms, we are um, familiar with concepts such as uh, collective intelligence and wisdom of the crowds, where the collective emergent outcome of a system is better and is more accurate than uh, the best of the individuals in the system. Theoretical work predicts higher accuracy and higher efficiency for groups compared to individuals. But also there are theories which predict um, biases in collective decision-making as well as a social loafing where individuals delegate the task to others and they think that because there are other people in the group taking care of the task, I don't need to work too much. Um, in pop culture, we have proverbs and sayings such as uh, two heads are better than one, which suggest collaboration is good. But at the same time, we have uh, things like too many cooks spoil their broth. Here I have an image of too many cooks and none of them looks happy and no one smiles. I think the broth is spoiled in this case. Uh, we wanted to have an experimental uh, approach to this question and uh, we turned to a real world citizen science project. Uh, in this citizen science project, uh, contributors have to categorize images that are automatically taken from a national park in Mozambique called Korongoza and uh, determine if the image shows an animal, what type of animal, and what does the animal is doing, and so on. This is not an easy task. The animals look very similar, and a non-expert cannot distinguish them easily. However, after a few trials and after a few minutes, you start learning uh, the differences between animals, and then you can uh, more accurately categorize these images. We split the individuals into two groups. Uh, one group were trained on a very specific set of images of a specific set of animals, and we used the same set in the testing stage. But the other group were trained on a more generic uh, set of animals, and we expected them not to perform as well as the other group when they uh, arrived to do the testing stage because they are not specialized on the type of animals that are more common in the testing set. Well, first of all, this is uh, what we get from the experiment. Actually, we see that people who were trained in a targeted set, and from now on we call them experts, perform well, their performance increases, and 
they improve uh, all the way towards the end of the experiment. Whereas the generally trained individuals, or we call them non-experts from now on, um, show a massive decline when they start uh, testing this stage. Even though they recover a little bit, they never uh, show the same performance as the expert group. Now the question is that what if I build groups of two individuals uh, with different combinations of expertise level? For example, two experts working together, two non-experts, and one expert, one non-expert. Well, here we compare the groups with individual experts, and we see that the individual expert outperforms a, a group of two experts and a group of one expert, one non-expert, which is quite interesting. That means that having another expert helping you, if you are an expert, does not increase the efficiency, which is the total number of correct categorizations per minute. When you look at the non-expert individual, the non-expert solo, even there, you see that an additional expert or an additional non-expert does not increase the efficiency. When you look at the accuracy, which is just the number of correct answers, regardless of time, uh, here we see the same pattern for the expert. Uh, but in the non-expert group, we see that adding the extra expert person increases the accuracy, even though the overall efficiency has not been increased because they uh, work at a lower rate. Uh, the additional expert slows down the non-expert. So if I want to summarize, it turns out that collaboration might have been a little bit overrated, particularly if someone is an expert in a complex task, they probably are better off working on their own. Well, ironically, this was a project that I conducted in collaboration with two of my colleagues, uh, Vincent Straub and Milena Svetskova, and uh, there is a preprint of the work available uh, publicly. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Luke Fon, and following, I will talk about data science of judicial decisions for evidence-based housing policies in Spain. The effects of the 2007 global financial crisis have been devastating for a great part of the population in Spain, especially in terms of housing loss and access, with consequences still visible nowadays. To put into numbers, available records show that more than 700,000 foreclosure procedures started in less than 10 years. This data unveils the ineffectiveness of the approach undertaken by legislators and the judiciary in order to confront the complex situation. During this presentation, I will present an approach that is able to quantify the footprint that such a major social issue leaves in the judiciary. We analyze the jurisprudence related to housing, revealing the response of the system to not only the social problematic, but to legislative changes and to other external factors as well. In this way, we are able to address the general problem of analyzing the long-term evolution of content in a corpus of judiciary decisions, so to calibrate the interplay with the surrounding societal factors that could shape this evolution. The data we use encompasses a corpus of texts corresponding to several judiciary decisions relating, related to housing issues in Spain spanning the last 20 years. Then, for each document, we take two different elements. First, we take those law articles used by judges in their reasoning, and second, we take the words that form the discourse. Then, we convert this content into two different topic mixtures, one for the articles and one for the words. To do so, we use a network approach that infers communities in the network formed by the documents and their elements and then uses these communities as topics. Then, having our corpus converted as a collection of topic mixtures, we aggregate these results by periods of time, yielding a topic mixture that evolves in time. In this way, we can finally make measurements on the change by using information theory-based measures of divergence. As our first result, we show here the mentioned evolution for both the topic mixture of the words and of the articles. Here, each layer is a topic and the thickness represents the relative importance in a given year. This representation allows us to have a global insight on the evolution of content in both the discourse and the use of legislation. Knowing the content of each topic, we can access to the details of the particular changes observed in the evolution. 
As an example, we observe that some topics which we draw in purple become more prominent in the last years, with peaks around 2015 and 16. A zoom in some of these topics can reveal words related to unfair terms in the mortgage contract, and in particular related to a clause that was declared null and abusive by the Supreme Court. Another example can show words related to foreclosing procedures. In an analogous way, the details in the topic article evolution could be revealed. As announced, we evaluate these changes in a more precise way by computing the callback library divergence of the topic distribution in one year given the previous one. This measure is also referred as the relative entropy, in the sense that it measures the surprise of a distribution conditioned to expecting another one, which in our case is the topic distribution of the year before. We can easily observe an abrupt change that gets its maximum around 2016, and we can observe it in both evolutions, meaning that both the discourse and the use of legislation change in parallel, and that our result can be obtained using two very different ingredients. Our approach shows how to take advantage from the digitalization of judicial decisions. We showed that it offers the possibility to track social processes in an alternative way. In contrast to other previous approaches that use other sources such as Twitter, newspapers and similars, we saw that it is possible to directly unveil those most sensitive issues, which are those that end up in court. Thank you very much.